Be a mug that Scotland folk. What? Did I say something really good? Okay. With him. Yeah. Oh, I, just, I want to say, I mean, some of you were at the Land Use Committee, but I just wanted to thank the supervisor because he really took a leadership role at the Land Use Committee in framing all the issues we talked about tonight. And I think he did a great job of setting up. Again, you took the words right out of my mouth. Okay, who else? Uh, just go ahead, Mark. I have an easy, I think, easy question for Brad um, because I, I don't know the context of what you were commenting on. And you were hinting that there was something um, insidious about 80% of the project land pro uh, the land being owned by Golden Gateway. But you didn't finish the statement for those of us who aren't in the know. Why is that significant? What are the political or legal implications of them owning 80%? Why did you bring that up several times? So uh, what people don't understand is who the partners in the deal are. Who's going to benefit from this? Who really stands to gain? And there's been one set of people standing up from Pacific Waterfront Partners. But the people that own Golden Gateway own 80% of the site. So they're not, I mean, they're silent partners, but they're partners. And all the upzoning happens and all the zoning changes on their land. And the question you would, I would ask, if I remember the Board of Supervisors or remember the Planning Commission, is if I'm going to grant some discretionary favor, that's one way to think about it, what am I getting in return? And we've already pointed out that we're not getting the kind of housing the city needs. We're not getting a lot of money. We're not getting a real good connection. A lot of the stuff that Bob showed, we already have. Most of the stuff up there, we already have. We're losing active recreation. And is, is Marion Grigsby here? He spoke at land use, and he talked about the um, active recreation being lost. He called it recreation uh, under assault, I think. And he talked about how years ago, if you were a family in San Francisco, there were bowling alleys everywhere to go to. I mean, it's a business. It's not public space, but it's active recreation. And we've lost almost all of it. Japantown Bowl was the most recent one I know of that was destroyed for condos. And then there used to be the Mission Bay Driving Range. I actually took my, my family members there and people visiting me, my relatives from out of town there. It was kind of fun. It's gone. It's a development now. And then you read in the papers a few weeks ago about how the, the soccer courts over at Pier 27 were displaced. Hopefully they'll find a new place to go. But there's been more and more and more active recreation destroyed in the city. And if you want to keep families here, the thing I keep hearing about is three things. You've got to have good schools, but if you can't afford to live here, you can't go to the schools if they get good. But the other thing you need is you need active recreation, places to take your family to do things, to be active, to be healthy. And so when we talk about Golden Gateway, it adds an additional piece to that, which is they are destroying the very housing we need to keep families here. By participating in this, they're destroying a lot of the active recreation that families in the city use. And it turns out, according to the San Francisco Weekly, they're not paying their fair share of property taxes either. So the question again is, why would, we, why would we want to support this? Why would anyone want to support a project that is this bad in so many different ways? So that was the point of the 80%. I hope that answers. Thank you. Yeah, that's Thank you. Yes. So why would so, we Paul, go? you've had, I'm, I, I'm trying to get other people. Yes, sir. Um, as, as I understand it, the major funding source for this is basically based on the, the life savings of a large number of middle class teachers. Calisters. If correct. that's the case, has a hard-hitting PR firm or a financial proposal been made to embarrass them with the help of perhaps the teachers' union to, to cut off Calisters from this? You know in the past Calisters has been extremely sensitive in the last several years to their public profile when they've had any kind of ethical uh, issues their CIO had to leave, et cetera. So, so they're sensitive to issues like this, I would think. And if you can cut off the funding, a lot of your problems go away, I would think. Uh, you're, you're absolutely correct, but your, the key question is if you can cut off the funding. Uh, a number of us have gone to Sacramento on a couple of occasions, but some of them are sitting here in the audience. Uh, we have not really received a very welcome response from them. If, Sue or Brad would like to further. We are much aware of that. By the way, are there any teachers in this room right now? Retired teachers. Well, and even if you're a current one, you're yeah. part of the system. <laughs> well, this is something that you people can do. You can really let them know that you're not happy with the way your investment money is going. 
Is that money not funding this this pre construction stuff? Yeah, twenty five. Yeah. Twenty five million dollars so far, yeah. Brad. Um, there were efforts to go to Sacramento and talk to them, but since I think the last effort, a couple things have happened. Both Cal Purs and Cal Sturs invested in a project in New York City called Stuyvesant Town. And I believe Cal Purs lost $700 million and Cal Sturs lost $100 million. There was a similar project in East Palo Alto where I think Cal Purs lost $100 or $200 million. So they've already spent $24 million on this project. And the question, when I talk to developers that I know, the question they all ask is, what did they spend it on? And I think that's a good question for teachers to ask. But my understanding is that if the Cal Sturs investment pool can't pay its teachers when the money's needed, then the taxpayers of California are on the hook for that. So not just teachers are interested in this, I think we should all be interested in whether or not they are doing their due diligence with their investments. And I think there may be, there may be, it may be time to go talk to them again about this since I think they're a little more sensitive to the issue than they used to be. Yes, the lady in green. And I would say not just to talk to them, but this story isn't out there because, you know, we read that the teachers' union money is funding this project, but there really needs to be a journalist who takes it on and, and says, this is how much money has been spent by the teachers' union on this. Right. I mean, the teachers are not getting a good return on investment at this stage, you know, so I think maybe we totally agree giving, with that. you know, giving the full story this, to... This is being worked yeah. out. Okay, great. That's great. I think that's great. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, to Brad, you just spoke to this point of the of attack on recreation, and one point that seems salient to me, I'm just curious to get your reaction or your reaction to, is um, that the recreation loss not just to club members, I think the club has been misrepresented in terms of how exclusive it is, but to the public. I mean, I can't, I still, I'm a club member, but still today I belong to a USTA tennis team based in Golden Gate Park, just because that's where I started and, and that's where I stay with this group of friends. But as, you know, my team members play at Golden Gateway a lot through USTA tournaments, and I'm just one team of in one league, and that happens, as you know, I, I imagine, you know, every weekend there's lots of teams on, uh, representing lots of people who are not club members. And I'm wondering if that point is, well, if it's useful, and if it's being made to, to somebody who can, you know, cares. We need, we need people like that to come to the hearings. When we, as soon as we have the information solid, it would be very helpful. P part of the people that need to hear it is when we have the, the joint hearing with Rec Park and planning. Rec Park is part of the problem. It's, they will be sitting there when we're talking to the planning commission. I think they should hear it because Rec Park has not done such a hot job lately. Can I ask something about that? Didn't you say that this is the only licensed USTA a tournament site in the city? I'm not. I'm not sure I use the right terminology there. But there's two. There's two. The, there's two. the, the, the South of Mark, the San Francisco Tennis Club, which, which is, is an indoor, right? which is indoor, and this one, which is outdoor. Uh, let Let me just. I can throw in a few statistics here for you. Uh, we have six at at the Golden Gateway Tennis and Swim Club. We have six hundred tennis player, 600 members, tennis player, not counting the guests, not counting the tournaments. We have over 2,200 actual members of the club, and we average between two and 3,000 guests a year. This is not a small, closed, private club. And that, we keep trying to get that out all the time. And 600 members of the tennis would be without a court if this thing were to go on. Plus, whoever, there's no, there's not sufficient courts in this city, we know. Hey Lee, is that number of guests, does that include the, I, I don't think you're, when you come from Golden Gate Park, it's not really a, you don't sign up as a guest. No, you don't. Yeah, you don't. So you, I walk, think you walk right the And there is a lot of people who do. A lot of come every yeah. weekend. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Before everybody leaves. Yeah, Fred. Well, we're not ready to leave. We got refreshments. There's a silent partner. In addition to David, pardon me, the partners that own the Golden Gate Ways. My name is Fred Besides the silent partner, 
and the sin the, the summer, summer Sobra, which is the Golden Gateway Center, which is Tim Cruz, <coughs> trying to develop this project. We have a silent partner on our side that would love to do what we did for them when they bought the San Francisco Swim and Tennis Club. I've spoken to President Chu about this issue, where the city is looking for how to deal with recreational problems, where the city is now looking how to almost take every type of recreational component be some kind of public, I mean, a, a producing revenue type of entity. In essence, the city is upside down financially. At the same time, they're reducing the quality of the recreational experience that San Francisco has enjoyed throughout their history. We're talking about taking away a little baby swimming tennis club, nine tennis courts, but is so popular with all these people in this neighborhood for 40 years. It's an incredible asset to this whole neighborhood. What I'm getting at is that one of the things we did four years ago with Sue Hester, working to together collectively put some zoning in place that did not allow anybody to develop public or private real estate for recreate for <coughs> development purposes without retaining the existing recreation facilities where they are. We got the city to, to adopt that. What that caused is 20 homes that was going to spend $45 million to buy the San Francisco Tennis Club, the 26 tennis courts to stop, and it caused the Western Athletic Clubs to buy it. They paid $15 million for that site and then spent $5 million more making it one of the great recreational facilities in San Francisco. I have talked to two principals. They won't let me talk and say what I'm about to say. But they would love to take over this club and make it as quality as they've made the San Francisco Tennis Club. They, that is what KKNR does. And their KKNR big is 5,000 times bigger than Simon Stillgrove and the Teachers Pension Fund. And they own the Bay Club. They own Squaw Valley. They own all these things. They would love to take this little jewel of a recreation facility and make it what Brad proposed in his plan with all the bicycles and whatever, make it super special. They're sitting there lately. They can't come up and challenge Simon because they want to be his vendor. At the same time, they would love to do something to work with Tim Fu to make it much bigger than it is. And they're sitting there just with a little bit of a nudge to say, how do we make this work? They can't come out and say that otherwise they lose the right to be the vendor for the swimming club that it wants to be. But there's something there that we can, if we go after it, as I told David earlier, let's let the whole city come up and look at how recreational is done, not just the Golden Gate with Swim Tub, but Rink on, I mean, all the different areas that are losing it. Let's put something on the ballot to rezone this to allow it only to be recreational, uh, just keep the recreational facility that's there. And Western Athletic Clubs will be right behind this tomorrow afternoon. Thank you. Do you have a comment, David? Well, I mean, I, I'm very willing to continue this conversation and see where it goes. And we have to figure out just, again, how we broaden the conversation to be one of citywide recreation needs. Because again, I think many of my colleagues and many commissioners view this as, it's a, it's, a, it's a random project in a random neighborhood and just don't understand the community and neighborhood fabric that they would be significantly ripping apart and impacting. Okay, we're gonna be winding down in a few minutes. Go ahead. I hope I can talk, because I have this laryngitis. Wow. In listening to all these presentations and also having had a career in this field I don't think there is enough attention being paid to a theme keep it simple kiss keep it simple stupid we need to organize some presentations <coughs> around some central themes and when I listen to you all tonight and believe me I love it when I, swim there, when I listen to you I think one of the biggest themes we need to get at is that upzoning from a design standpoint, that is going to change the entire view of that waterfront. That is one thing that needs to be done. I, mean, I just think we need to have some meetings, we need to break into groups and have, and I'm happy to help, put some presentations together that have a unified theme. Thank, thank you very much, and we, we would certainly call on your help. Uh, uh, Louise Rennie just left, but she was the one that brought up the fact that <laughs> and we're very much aware of what you're saying, is that we don't want another Miami Beach. That's a That's exactly. Okay, just a couple of more questions, and we want to give you a chance to socialize and talk to people. Go ahead. Well, I think it's important to ask questions, too. I've got a lot of questions here, so I just have to pick one. I, I want to make one just one sentence comment about these hearings coming up. I mean, the Planning Commission is the only place that there's likely to be any discussion. The poor commission and the rec park are just going to rubber stamp this whole thing. They don't really care about the details. 
it's you know they're just going to support it. Uh, I was going to ask how given given the fact that he took away this tennis club at the last minute. I mean this came yeah, right. as a complete surprise to everybody. It seems to me that should have a significant impact on the EIR. Uh, I don't understand why they can progress without making uh, a, a supplemental document dealing with, with uh, the loss of the tennis facility. You are not informed on how the planning department <coughs> thinks. Well, we have been pushing this. One of the things there is they totally changed the orientation of the swimming pools so that the swimming pools will be in shadow and there is no analysis in it and when I said there has to be an analysis of how you change the shadows the response is it's not a prop K issue and it's not shadows on public space and therefore it's not necessary now the Planning Commission has the ability to override their staff the Board of Supervisors has the ability to override their staff but we have been raising those issues the shadow studies show that the entire Embarcadero is shadowed in the middle of the day because of their complex. So you go down the west side of the Embarcadero, their big, new, wide, shrunk, 15-foot sidewalks. <laughs> it's in shadow. There, but no one is paying any attention. They say it's not Sue Beerman Park. They are, pardon me, they're just nuts in the planning department staff. People can, those who, people who want to read the analysis, the staff analysis, Lee can forward you the links that we have, and they're all going to be on, on a, we will do this on our website. The links to all of the staff reports are available, plus the EIR. I'm just going to show one page. Those of you who have the EIR, comments and responses, or the CD, hang on. I think you, you can hold the phone and I'll oh, put this up. <laughs> this page here, which is 3B28 and 3B29, is the area, and I'm going to leave this. Arthur loaned this back to me. This, this shows the land that they're doing the land swap on, and this is the most cynical thing I've ever seen. They're doing a land swap, and I've puzzled on this for a day. Of equal value, right? Yeah, Supposed, and they have supposedly. notches all the way down here. And they're saying that's retained under the public trust. They have these little notches. That's Bob, what I asked Bob to do some measurements on. They say, oh, this is all not, not being transferred. All the way around here, all these little notches. And they say, that's part of our square foot of the public trust. These tiny little notches. They, they talk about this one, but when you look at their calculations, they have these that are only one, it's only the ground level because underneath it's parking. And above it, there's balconies for the condos. And they are so cynical. And it, I mean, this is the kind of stuff that I literally puzzled and said, what are these notches? And I asked the planning department, what are the notches? Oh, that is because they're articulating the building facade. They're doing little indentations of the building. No, they're not. They're saying this is public space. It has little value. Little tiny plots. Um, and so this is, those of you who have the EIR, look at pages B, 3B, 28, 29. It's actually facing pages. There are very few graphics. You'll find it pretty easily. It's at the beginning. Um, they have all kinds of tricks. We're calling them out on their tricks. And thank you for the low mark. Okay. Uh, okay. One more. Okay. Uh, I, I just besides Simon and the developer, and maybe I'm coming in late, but is it the planning committee? Who's the Who's the bad guy? Golden Gateway should be directed. All of them. All Gold, them. Golden all Gateway. Them. Gateway is right. big in this project right they are hiding that was the thing that freaked out mary murphy that propelled her up to the front at the board of supervisors and who's mary murphy again she is the attorney for simon snowgrove she's his fancy attorney <laughs> louise called out golden gateway and they freaked out because they don't want to have the baggage 
of Golden Gateway, which is cheating on their property taxes, has made four, this is the fourth attempt, every other attempt to do this was from Golden Gateway. They have attempted to build three times before. This is the fourth. They are Mr. Snellgrove's enabler partner. They get back the the Washington, pardon me, the Jackson Pacific block. They get that back. So why isn't our strategy to find a way to go after Tim? Poole? We are doing. We are, it. We, we're not sleeping on this. Yeah. 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 Blocks, but well, the problem is there's no newspapers. There, there, there's no newspapers there in this town. There are some now. things that you don't publish until they're done. Okay. But really, but I want to. Late, can I can I make one comment? I just want to get back to a, the question you raised, which I think is really important. That's what I agree. Yeah. And that is that there's a dozen things wrong with this project, but it's really hard. When I was working ten years ago, the newspapers had investigative reporters, they had land use reporters. The land use reporters had been around on beat for ten, twenty years. Now the land use reporters change every six months. It's the entry level job. But what I've learned is that. If you go to a reporter and tell them the 12 things that are wrong with this, they just, their eyes glaze over. Mm -hmm. So one of the things is each story focuses on one thing. This is about one thing. And that seems to be working. But the theme I think that we're coming to is we tore down the Embarcadero Freeway for this? Because when you think about the views that you can see that we got back by tearing that thing down, that was 55 feet high. This is 90 feet higher than the old Embarcadero Freeway. And everybody in the city gets the, the wonder of tearing down the Embarcadero Freeway. And if you say to them, we, we tore it down, we went through all that to get the same thing back but taller, that I think starts to resonate with people all over the city. But we could use your help because we're kind of, we're a little burned out on trying to figure out what the best way to describe this is. And we need help from new, new people and new thinking to help us boil it down to things like that. But I think that's what's going to get us from here on is to focus on just one or two aspects of the story in each article and have a couple of a couple of overarching themes that everybody understands. Thank you. I think uh, Lee is oh, Bob? Yeah, could we use somebody who, who comes on as an it's a task enough just to put together groups to tackle the various aspects that you're talking about. And it's just we need someone just to even do that. And just, I think, I don't know, Lee, if that's... And we're, this, uh, this entire thing is going to move. We bought ourselves a couple weeks. We bought ourselves at least three weeks. This is coming down the track. This is not something where you go on a retreat and have a seminar and you massage the issues. We are dealing with this on an hourly basis right now. Thank you, Sue. It's, and I think you get the message tonight. These people are working day and night. All of us, volunteers, and our and our professional staff here, and David Chu, you're being kept in the loop, and and we appreciate everything you're doing. Uh, I think you get the message, the kind of help that we need from you, and uh, I want to thank you all for showing up tonight. Yes. Lee, what's the <coughs> present status of the Susan Brand Holly appeal on the uh, environmental CEQA lawsuit? Um, delay all this? She has filed an appeal to the Court of Appeal, and it's my understanding that she is either has already filed the opening brief yeah. or is filing it in the next 24 hours. It's like right now. Yeah, it's happening this week. So what will that do about stalling this project approval? It doesn't stop. She is not getting a TRO. She's not getting an injunction. But. Uh, we're, we're raising the issue. I, can yeah. I just have one uh, real quick question, please? It's important. Seriously, because I, I just want to say that some of us here were very involved with the little triangle on Lombard Street. And that little triangle looked like Telegraph Hill Dwellers. I was then vice president. And a bunch of basically wealthy people, which is the way we've been labeled here, I think, by some of the supervisors in the city, as just selfishly wanting something for themselves and not for the city. Well, the reason Michaela Aliotto, who wasn't originally on our side, the reason she told us that she was the swing vote in the end is because she went to that library, that little library with her husband, who had, of course, to drive her there, and she saw Chinese American kids who she presumed were poor people, and they are. I live in that neighborhood. They're poor people who use that library. The people on Telegraph Hill, their officers, they generally don't use that library. They didn't need the triangle. What, what I said to Lee four, you know, years ago when I got involved in this project is, where are the summer camp kids? 
Where are the tennis, the guy left unfortunately, but the guy here, where are those people who don't belong to the club? Where are those people who, like me, work for St. Vincent de Paul Society, make almost no money and yet still are members of the club? And there are people like that. In other words, poor people can belong to this club. If you take how much it costs to go to the public pool on Lombard Street, owned by the city and county of San Francisco, and you went swimming every day and paid the money to go there, it would cost less to go to the pool here. That's People don't know that. Well, yeah. well, but we, we have to tell the supervisors that it's cheap to belong to this club. We, we, and that anybody can do it. Absolutely, I, I agree with you, Mark. Uh, and of course, you know that Fog has been sponsoring a, a scholarship program to bring kids into the to the summer camp, kids camp. We've had two years of success, and we certainly hope that that continues. But that means support from the community, and that's people who are sitting here and your friends. There are flyers in the back. Uh, please take some and pass them out. We'll have some more at the club tomorrow. And I want to thank all of you for showing up tonight and, and participating in this. I think you have to admit we're working 24-7 right now, and we're going to save yeah. this club. Thank you very much. I just wanted to just wanted to thank you for coming. Um, oh, sure. On Thursday, we always so appreciate it. I know you can. <laughs> uh, we, for, we forgot to tell you something. Part of our we're doing a counter jam at the planning commission under general public comment from now until the cows come home. The first wave of this is this Thursday. The planning commission meeting starts at noon. General public comment is around uh, 12 30, 1 o'clock. There will be a report about the Board of Supervisors land use hearing before general public comment. We are going to go talk about our issues to the Planning Commission, which is broadcast on SGTV. A lot of people watch it. Every Thursday, general public comment for the foreseeable future until there is a hearing. We need people that can come and speak and talk about the broad range of issues that are not nitty-gritty details of, the, of how this building looks, but what the policies are. So we forgot to tell you, but that is where we are going. Thursday, Planning Commission, around 12.30 every week. Five people can speak under general public comment, and Brad and I will coordinate that. So, we forgot to tell you. Sorry. Where is it? Where is it? City Hall, room 400, where all the planning commission meetings happen. So, this gives, we can just talk about anything we want. So, we're going to talk about our issues because the planning commission hasn't had a presentation on this project. Their first presentation they will have is when they have the presentation to approve it. And so we want to get into their heads. Sorry, again. Uh, please uh, enjoy some of the wine and uh, whatever else is left back there. Mark, thank you. No, no, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.